Hallo und guten Abend. Willkommen zu einer Veranstaltung. Hello and good evening. We'll be talking about Egypt tonight. I'm Bente Scheller. I'm head of the department to Middle East and North Africa. And uh, I'm very happy to inform you that uh, uh, you will now have the pleasure to uh, listen to a panel with Nadim Hori, Dina Mohba, and Ahmed Abeda. And But first, I would like to uh, introduce you to Mr. Gunesh, our new department uh, head for Israel and Egypt. Um, he's not so visible here, but he is in the, uh, in the, in the hall. Um, if you need a translation, uh, there will be no Arabic uh, on the podium, but there will be German and English. I will uh, address you in uh, uh, German, and then for uh, the sake of the um, smooth uh, discussion here on the on the panel, we will switch to English. If you uh, are not capable of, uh, of understanding English, then please uh, help yourself with a uh, uh, conference um, uh, receiver. Please do not record this here and do not make photos. We had the ninth anniversary of the um, Egypt revolution. We couldn't celebrate it, uh, unfortunately, because uh, the revolution hasn't brought much, not what was expected. But nonetheless, we have a, a fascinating uh, uh, breadth of activists um, and, and artists, etc., that uh, speak up for um, rights, uh, freedoms, and other things we would not have seen uh, without the revolution. So we should um, uh, understand that there are activists that have a lot in store. Um, maybe uh, the big uh, dreams, the big aspirations have not fulfilled nonetheless. Uh, we support this uh, and at uh, Heinrich Böll Foundation. Uh, we see a situation in Egypt uh, where human rights um, violations are uh, uh, happening every day. Uh, 4,000 people were um, uh, in, uh, arrested uh, as of last year, but uh, hasn't had an impact on, on the relationship. Germany, as you all know, has a very good relationship with the dictatorship of uh, Azizi, and other states may have uh, uh, human rights in their portfolio when they travel there, but uh, they uh, don't unpack them. Um, so it is worth uh, um, checking what are the spaces where activists move. Um, spaces are always uh, 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 viewed to be static, but nonetheless are created, they are shaped by people that take the space and find ways uh, uh, to uh, adjust to um, constantly changing uh, uh, situations and conditions. That's why I'm very uh, uh, pleased that we have two um, scientists and activists that have been looking into spaces, uh, physical spaces, but also virtual uh, spaces. And of course, it is not uh, spaces within uh, Egypt, but also spaces within the diaspora and how that all um, uh, is interdependent. Uh, we will be discussing here on the panels. We have here on the panel Nadim Mouri. Um, he is uh, a jurist. He is the managing director of Arab Reform Initiative at the think tank here. Um, uh, seated in Paris, he is also at the Human Rights Watch uh, uh, and has other very important activities uh, um, uh, looking at human rights uh, uh, issues and violations. Uh, um, uh, we have an expert in him here um, that will be talking more uh, about how the Arab Reform Initiative is, is organized. Um, uh, the, the, uh, they um, were instrumental for uh, these, uh, for this evening here because um, uh, the papers were from them. We have here Adina uh, Hoppa. Um, she is a uh, women's activist. Uh, she is living in Berlin and is writing her doctoral thesis here at the Center for um, Middle East Studies. Um, her um, subjects are, among other things, participation and, uh, and emotional uh, bond to um, spaces and social relationship. We have uh, Ahmad Garbeya, who is a programmer and, and activist from Cairo, uh, who has 
been looking into network policies a lot and is also an advisor for data security and both uh, will be presenting their papers and will tell us more about how they came about uh, with this. But first, I would like to uh, give the floor to Nadim Huli and uh, tell us what the Arab Reform Initiative is doing. And Danke. Uh, Guten um, Tag. That's the extent of my German. Uh, my apologies, I'll have to, to speak in English. Uh, thank you very much, Bente, for your introduction, and, and thank you, everyone, for, for coming and for the, to Heinrich Bull for hosting us. Just very briefly, so that we actually get to the meat of the subject, the Arab Reform Initiative is a uh, regional think tank uh, focusing on the Arab world, or the Middle East, North Africa region, um, the difference is this is not a think tank that focuses necessarily on international relations, but about uh, how uh, to reform uh, the region from within. It's an organization that existed since 2014 in reaction and against uh, the Bush agenda, uh, sorry, 2004, in reaction to the Bush agenda of imposing reform at the site of um, guns uh, by occupying uh, uh, Iraq and imposing change. At the time, a group of think tanks from the region came together, federated themselves to say, instead of just being, you know, uh, democratization and reforms will happen bottom up, uh, societies in the region are very vibrant. Uh, we want to be able to produce uh, knowledge and policies from the bottom up. Um, in a way, the think tank has evolved as the region has evolved. And, I, and today, um, you know, our ambition, our hope, is we would like to be the think tank that can accompany this new generation that came into the region after 2011. Why do I talk about new generation? This is not just the youth. I mean, our, our starting point is to say, uh, the old model of governing the region is dead. Uh, we may not know yet what's going to succeed it, but the old social contract uh, no longer exists in the region. In 2011, we saw a first wave of countries that rejected the old social contract, and we continue to see countries uh, now from Algeria, from Lebanon, from Iraq, from Sudan, that are saying, the past model no longer works for us. It doesn't work for us politically, it doesn't work for us economically, it doesn't work for us culturally. These are very vibrant societies, um, and yet the voices uh, that are emerging are not having a sufficient platform to talk about their experiences and their desires. Uh, so what we try to do, we're very small, so it's very modest, but our ambition at least is to give a platform, to give a voice, to shed light on all the dynamics happening after 2011. And this explains uh, the reason why we had these really very two talented researchers producing two very interesting papers that I would invite you to, uh, to read, looking at new forms of mobilization and activism that have emerged in Egypt and that have continued in Egypt since 2013. Um, we look at as well uh, Arab Reform Initiative, so we will look at new forms of mobilization in Egypt and other countries. We look at uh, youth movements, and again, the youth in the region, uh, very similar, I think, to the youth in Germany and many European countries. They are very political, but they don't want to be in political parties. Uh, they are very engaged, but they think about their engagement in different ways. Uh, we seek to understand that. We need to, you know, we, we seek whenever we can to support these new forms of engagement, to give them voice and to better understand them. Because I think the big challenge today is, will these new movements, very horizontal, uh, very exciting, very democratic in many ways, will they be sustainable? And can we learn? Because our key model is, South-South collaboration, if something has worked in Tunisia, then maybe people in Lebanon, in Egypt, in Sudan can learn from it. Uh, if something has worked in Sudan, maybe people in Iraq can learn from it. So promoting South-South, but also promoting South to North uh, information sharing. And this is why I think this, for me, this uh, event today uh, uh, and our partnership with Heinrich Boll on the event makes a lot of sense because it's uh, an opportunity to hear about indigenous ways of people, how people are thinking about their activism. 
Um, I'll stop there. I'll be happy to, to talk more later, but I want us to get into the uh, substance of, of, of the evening. Thank you very much, Nadim. And yes, I, w I don't want to comment now. I would rather like to ask all of you questions after you give your presentations. So, Ahmad, I would hand over to you. You've been writing on, well, you go, you go ahead and explain it yourself. Fine, you just Fine. Are you sure you don't want to say anything? No, please go ahead. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, well, the paper I have uh, written to ARI is uh, is part theorizing, which is something I allow myself the liberty to do from time to time, and part a report on uh, work that I have been doing with uh, certain groups uh, uh, on um, on the practices of uh, collaboratively. Producing knowledge. Uh, okay. Sorry. All right. Yeah. On on uh, on the practices of collaboratively um, uh, producing and curating knowledge, and uh, availing it to the to the wider public, uh, and primarily in Arabic. Um, in the in the theoretical part, I argue that. Uh, by facilitating this uh, process of uh, working together for uh, people who have um, uh, interests in specific fields of knowledge or subjects that somehow uh, tackle uh, public um, issues that um, occupy the minds of, of uh, activists or, or normal people who uh, in, in many ways uh, in Egypt, as in other regions, of, as uh, Nadim has been saying, uh, are uh, critical or um, unsatisfied with, with the nature of the society they are living in, in all the different layers of uh, politics and economy. Uh, so if you allow, my, my theory is that if you allow s some people to work together uh, in curating and producing knowledge and document this journey of learning that they are going through together and allowing this uh, output to the wider public, you enrich the, the wider public discussion in this field. Um, and also, as another goal, uh, you facilitate the creation of links and self-organization between these people. Who, um, and the example I, I report on in my paper is that of Wikigender, which is um, an effort to um, curate and write uh, in Arabic about the issues of women and, and gender and um, the queer communities in Egypt and the Arab world. Not from the perspective of uh, translation as much as, uh, as much of the available material is, but rather from a localized perspective. And uh, from, uh, if we may say, uh, the first uh, hand uh, experiences or the participants in their engagement, whether they are uh, women or men or queer or not, uh, their, their daily uh, interactions with the society they live in when these issues are uh, at stake or are being uh, discussed. Um, so yes, um, this uh, project that I, I describe and try to analyze and somehow criticize and reflect on, on the paper has been going for the past four years now. Uh, and should I elaborate more or have a round and come back? So you're not only studying it, but you're also part of the project of the Wiki Gender? Uh, yes. Um, um, I'm providing the technical support for the group, but also um, trying to build the community around this concept of working together to to curate and, and publish knowledge in the field. So my role is twofold. Uh, it's seeding the community, um, overseeing the transition to uh, a self-organized uh, role or um, uh, self-organized governance model and providing the technical support which I would love to uh, uh, 
provide and do for uh, several groups as much as I can. So basically, there is a kind of platform. You all contribute with knowledge that you're generating and that you're bringing together. How many of you? How many are you? And do you know each other yeah, personally? Well, okay, uh, I think the active uh, editors or contributors right now is uh, around 40 people, maybe. Uh, half of which are in Cairo, the other half in Beirut, because. Um, Once the, um, the project um, uh, was launched, um, the core group received several uh, messages of interest and uh, um, requests for collaboration from as far as Mauritania. And uh, the next further, the, the, the next step would, uh, was uh, going to Beirut because it's the next major uh, city where uh, this kind of activity is uh, present and where there are uh, lively communities who are also interested in this uh, field of research and, and uh, knowledge. Uh, so yeah, this is how far uh, it's been so, so far. Great, thank you very much for this introduction to this online space that you're particularly looking into. Uh, I would like to go to Dina because she has been working on a physical space, a hospital, a part of Cairo that was very central in 2011 and she has researched what has happened since then in terms of the space and its inhabitants. Thank you uh, so much, Benta, and thank you for the Arab Reform Initiative for allowing me um, a space where I could publish this paper and for Heinrich Bill, of course, for organizing this event, uh, which I think is very important, especially now uh, during the ninth anniversary of the Egyptian Revolution. Um, so my paper focuses on the rights of the urban poor, the right to the city, and local politics in, uh, in Cairo. And I look at one specific uh, neighborhood, as, as Benta mentioned, it's um, called Maspiru Triangle, Musallas Maspiru. And it's a neighborhood, it's um, considered an informal neighborhood or a popular neighborhood. Uh, in Arabic, Manta Ashabeya or Manta Ashwaeya. And it's, um, it used to be uh, adjacent to Tahrir Square. This neighborhood housed um, more than 4,000 families for generations. It's a really old neighborhood. Um, and it played an important role during the revolution. And um, I sort of looked at um, the struggle of the people and the residents of Maspiru since the 90s against forced eviction and to keep their neighborhood until the neighborhood was completely demolished in 2018. So now it's a vacant land. Um, it's gone completely. Um, and I think it's important when looking at sort of um, this expedited urban restructuring uh, policies that are happening around Cairo and affecting the urban poor is to look at the role of the urban poor in the Egyptian revolution, which was something that only a few studies tackled, not many people discussed. And here I'm not making any claims that all of the urban poor were the uh, 25 January revolution 2011. Um, but there was a critical mass. This is, this is not a homogeneous group of people. They are as diverse as any group of people. So some of them were supporters, some of them were not. And a critical mass of them actually played an important role uh, in old Cairo and in downtown Cairo, uh, especially in clashes with the police, in facilitating and guiding activists uh, around downtown and old Cairo, in defending the occupation of the square, in hiding activists in their homes at times, in ensuring that the supplies enter uh, the square. Um, and this was linked to their intimate knowledge of the space, uh, an accumulated generational knowledge of the space and their relative control to it. So I, based on, of course, engagement with literature, my own field work, I would argue that the removal of neighborhoods was it's not just the case of Maspiru neighborhood, but also many other neighborhoods around Cairo. And... Um, in some areas also outside of Cairo, um, it's not just an econo it's about uh, economic gains and uh, investment opportunities, as mostly the state argues, but also it has a political purpose. Um, and it is to deconstruct the politics of the urban poor and create new modes of control over the population, especially the urban poor. Um, so I argue that the Egyptian government dra is drastically changing downtown Cairo to erase the political and emotional history of the revolution where <clears throat> downtown Cairo really was sort of played an important role as its locus. 
<coughs> but I have to say that this plan was before the revolution. So under Mubarak, there was a plan developed called Cairo 2050, which aimed at um, drastically changing Cairo, modeling it after, I don't know, London 2050, Paris 2050, something like this. And after the revolution, it changed from Cairo 2050 to Cairo 2052. So it was just two years. Um, and it's a massive plan that would uh, filled with mega project, uh, like Maspiro area is now going to be the Manhattan of Cairo, um, uh, something like this. And it's also linked now under President Abdel Fattah Sisi with the construction of the new capital. He's creating a new capital for Egypt that is a little bit outside of Cairo. And it's a mega project that might cost around estimate, estimated 500 billion US dollars. Um, so really the story of eviction, forced eviction and displacement is not just of one neighborhood. There are other neighborhoods like such as the Wara Islands and Al Hattaba who are also threatened, that are also threatened by forced eviction. Um, and in order, it was essential for the state in order to uh, sort of create public acceptance and support and justify uh, sometimes violence and uh, forced eviction is to create um, the Baltagi discourse, which is the narrative of thuggery. Uh, Baltagi means thug uh, in Arabic. Um, and to um, depict these informal areas as pockets of uh, criminal activity, as places where terrorists and thugs, Baltagia, live, um, and ensure that in this way sort of get the needed uh, public uh, support uh, so that when forced evictions happens, this is seen as something that uh, is positive uh, to eradicate these criminal pockets. Um, so, and the solving Cairo's informality problem has been one of President Abdel Fattah Sisi's main presidential uh, promises. And uh, what is seen as a solution is creating a housing project called Al Asmarat. This is a big housing project. It has another name, Long Live Egypt, Tahiya uh, Masr, Masakin Tahiya Masr. And it is, um, Long Live Egypt was the slogan that President Abdel Fattah Sisi ran with uh, in the elections. And this shows you a bit how important this project is to the presidency. And it's a, it's a housing project that it's really in the periphery of Cairo. So maybe you can imagine um, relocating people from Mita to, I don't know, Spandau or even further. Um, and uh, the Asmarat housing project started in 2016. It's a massive uh, housing compound that is meant to accommodate more than 10,000 families. They already starting relocating people there. And I was able to visit to visit Asmarat, especially the people from Maspiro neighborhood who were relocated there. And of course, the people there have many, many problems, but I can uh, briefly group them into three main problems. First, uh, services or lack thereof. Uh, so people who lived in downtown Cairo were used to having access to everything from markets, hospitals, universities, schools. But now in this remote area where they're like around them, literally there is desert, um, they are unable to uh, find affordable goods or the services they need. There's no hospital in the compound, only a small clinic. And this has affected really um, uh, more women, of course, and senior citizens, people with special needs who are um, been affected by this change. Um, the second problem is, which is also linked to the distance, distance is the high, ra high uh, rate of unemployment. So young people lost their jobs with the move and now they have to take several modes of transportation just to reach where they work, which is uh, even more expensive than their salaries just to pay for the transportation. So there is a high rate of unemployment. Um, but I think what is more interesting is the change with the relationship with the state. So it's a different mode of surveillance and monitoring. In their old neighborhoods, they had some form of control over the space and intimate knowledge of the space. And these new areas, they are being really surveyed constantly by the police with checkpoints. And it is seen, the, the Asmarat as a housing project is seen not just sort of, um, uh, it's, it's, it's the state's idea, implementing the state's idea of an ideal society and trying to reform those people who have been living in informality for in so many years. And 
by fighting informality, the state is fighting the social practices, the communal social practices of these people and sort of deconstructing their social fabrics. So, so for instance, um, these people are used to uh, having communal meals together, especially when there is a high level of poverty. Communal meals allow for different um, members of the community to eat together uh, or have their weddings on the streets or funerals on the streets because simply they cannot afford to do it somewhere else. But this is all now prohibited because this is seen as informality and um, this is prohibited if they don't have special permits and so on and so forth. And this kind of surv constant surveillance have made the people feel like they have been moved into an open air prison. And this is sort of the sentiment or the code that they have been um, telling me. Um, just one last uh, two points I want to make um, is that I, I also found it so interesting how people living under these conditions were able to use very different means of resistance and very different and diverse means of sort of activism from taking the state to court, so taking the legal route, um, to using art, from using graffiti, graffiti campaigns in their neighborhoods or even in the new uh, compound or do, uh, having mahraganat, which is like a form of popular songs, um, just to raise awareness, communicate the to the people and um, sort of using social media because they are marginalized in mainstream media. So they have to use social media and they, they use it actually quite brilliantly to communicate, um, um, publish statements, document their struggle, trying to create links of solidarity and alliance um, and also community organizing. So in each of these communities, there's at least one or two um, sort of um, communal um, councils where they try to to, to, to represent the whole community in negotiation with the government, in discussions with, with the media. So for Maspiru, they developed the Maspiru Youth Alliance. For El Ware, for instance, they um, developed the El Ware Family Council um, to sort of represent the community and be able to um, have a voice. Um, and throughout their work, they try constantly to counter the state's narrative of thuggery and sort of speak out about that they are a diverse community, they are productive members, and they are citizens with equal rights. Um, and um, just finally, I, I wanted to say that um, I always think it's interesting that this is not just the case of Egypt. It's it's a, it's a bigger case of new new liberalizing cities. Uh, I think what is most interesting in non-democratic societies, I mean, you can see also like gentrification here and the high prices of rent, and there's a big movement in Berlin already about this. But in non-democratic societies, the citizens find themselves not in, in opposition with the investor, uh, but with the state itself. And I think this is what makes it uh, different contextually. Thank you. Uh, that gives us already so many things to talk about. I mean, one of the elements that you are also mentioning in your text, uh, you, you were saying their quote, uh, Maspero is their country and their home, to identify or to, to define how strong the identification of citizens is with exactly the place they are from. And if I'm understanding correctly, they take part of that spirit with them. They don't accept the state's uh, impetus to drive them apart. They go against it by reorganizing in different forms. But I mean, do I get it right? Is it different forms that they choose now because they have to let go of some old rituals? Um, could you elaborate on whether what they are doing is coming from the same spirit but different in form? Um, so what happened specifically in Maspiru is that they were offered three options. One option is that part of them were relocated to Asmarat. So in, in Asmarat, they are trying to keep this community alive. So they do, against all odds, try to meet together if they make a consensus in terms of they ha if they have grievances, develop them together, uh, have a few people, so f four or five people who represent the community from Maspiru who live there. Um, they try to still do these communal meetings, but of course it's 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 very it's very difficult. 
whether this would continue to be difficult or will they be able to have some control over the space that's still uh, very new because they've only moved there um, last year. Um, um, but there are still also 900 families that were promised that they would go back to Maspiro after the development. So this is something also that is still to be seen. Um, but those who took the monetary compensation and which was very little uh, and left the community whole together, they have a, a Facebook group um, um, and they constantly talk about how they really feel the, the, the lack of the social fabric, that they have been scattered all over, that they feel like they went out of their element, and which is true. I mean, I, I sat with people from Maspiro who told me they are older than the state. We've been here before Egypt. We've been here before Egyptian nation state, which is true. They have sometimes sakka milkeya, like property, uh, ownership, property from the king. So, um, um, so for them, it's, it's really, yes, they have like really strong affective attachments, generational attachments to these spaces and their neighborhoods, which is not only for them a place to live, but also means to survive. These social networks is for them a means to survive. Coming to the point that you just mentioned, uh, some of them, they have a Facebook group. If you talk about online activism and its role, how do people find each other online and how do they establish trust? Yeah, well, yeah, this is an interesting question. Uh, but if I were to reflect on how the specific project I worked on, uh, how things went there, it was um, mostly uh, by giving it a chance. I mean, people show interest and you just uh, give it a chance and meet them. And if things go well, if the chemistry between the persons go well, then you just accept them into 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 the group. But also, um, one of the one of the policies that have been governing this collective so far is that uh, it opted for controlled growth. Uh, so rather than having an open sign up on the website that says open an account and start writing or contributing, which is, for example, the model uh, of other websites like the famous uh, Wikipedia. Um, uh, Wikigender has opted to uh, grow in a controlled manner uh, by selecting people and by inducting them in the community, um, uh, by training them on the technicalities of using the platform, which is a little bit uh, non-intuitive, uh, in if, I, if I were to say. And also by integrating them into the community as, uh, as, as a living community, as a community that exists both in cyberspace and in the material space. Um, so this aspect is a little bit different than the question of establishing trust completely uh, without physical contact, which maybe, for example, be the subject of uh, technologies like, I don't know, blockchain or digital signatures or, or whatever that are more into, um, I would say, dehumanizing trust and making it uh, into an algorithm, uh, which is also a domain of its own and something that's being studied and experimented in and uh, a hot topic, actually. But uh, when it comes to work that is related to... Um, uh, questions in uh, about societies and how they and about um, issues that are uh, uh, burdening if I may say the people then uh, human interaction and traditional methods of trust are the way to go in my opinion and looking a bit further than the very specific project that you're working on in your paper if you look at other or at all forms of online activism, especially regarding Egypt. How inclusive would you say they are? Because of course it is a question of access also, who can participate? How inclusive do you think it is? Is it both for men and women to participate here? And how hierarchical is it also organized? Well, these are exactly the questions that are now being uh, uh, discussed within the group and which is something that I'm personally interested to see the outcomes of. Uh, in my opinion, the group has reached um, a certain maturity 
where these questions are being uh, hotly debated, if I may say. I mean, uh, just to, to give you a general overview of the composition, most of the con of the contributors and participants and the main uh, coordinators of the group are all women, uh, and. The question of uh, who is allowed to uh, be part of the group is, as usual, a political question before anything else. Uh, and because it's impossible to know uh, everything about a person before you allow him, and before and because part of the of the value of of doing this is actually uh, debating different views of how things are to be approached regarding this specific topic of, in this case, uh, women's issues and gender and sexuality. So I would say that uh, um, choosing people only because they agree with what we, with what we think is, 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 is just to uh, establish a monoculture where, everything, where everyone is the same and it wouldn't be as useful in my personal opinion. Uh, which is irrelevant because I, I, I am actually uh, not part of the governance uh, of this body uh, any longer. I mean, not after the, the first few months. Uh, but um, the, the, the varieties in, in, in the opinions, even within, uh, within the sphere of people who identify as uh, feminists, for example, is not is not something is not trivial. It's it's still big enough. There are feminists from uh, Marxist backgrounds and feminists from uh, anarchist backgrounds and feminists from uh, Islamist backgrounds, um, and this is something that is interesting to see. And there are people who are curious and have more questions than ideologies to propose. And all of this composition is what makes the. The experiment uh, useful in my opinion because it's the um, it's the steps towards the answers that are important rather than the answers themselves. And that, yeah, that's what I think. Sorry, if I may just add one question. If you look beyond uh, Vicky Gender, if you look at online activism in a more general way, because you know the Egyptian revolution has been wrongly dubbed as a Facebook revolution. We've seen the WhatsApp revolutions. Somehow there is a focus um, wrongly so on the role of technology, maybe as something um, higher than actually it is. However, it is important. It is an important space. And if you look beyond the limited and controlled space of big agenda, on the one hand, for women, it is easier to participate possibly online because that means they do not have to physically leave certain spaces. At the same time, we see as soon as women are online, they get a lot of negative comments, a lot of hate speech. And this is what makes uh, some of them shy away once again from this medium. How would you judge it in case of Egypt or in t uh, terms of what's happening online? Is it different? Is it somehow the same all over? Mm. Well, uh, uh, communications technology has an emancipatory property, of course, but it also has uh, uh, a property of aiding suppression. I mean, we have seen this happen, and this is a major discussion that's taking place now all over. I mean, all the discussions about privacy and the role of, uh, of uh, global corporations and uh, um, the, ro the, the roles of uh, privacy laws and the extent of uh, technologies like facial recognition or eavesdropping or whatever. I mean, it's all... Technology has no opinion about how it's being used naturally. Uh, and what's been happening so far is that uh, non-democratic governments have, have learned a lot uh, how to use technologies in their favor. So the, the period you are talking about, uh, 2011 and before it, uh, individuals and uh, politically active groups had the upper hand in technology and how to use it. But now I argue that uh, governments have allocated huge resources to catch up and even go a step farther than what individuals uh, could possibly have. And there are many theorists who write about these issues, uh, uh, very good uh, analyses and, and uh, propositions about it. Um, and yeah, um, this is why, in my opinion, um, social activism should continue to be a uh, a human aspect rather than purely uh, technologically dependent. 
Uh, and this is why community building in the project of Wiki Gender is as important. And the lessons learned from social interactivity between or social interaction between the participants are as valuable as the um, purely um, knowledge uh, outcomes of it. Great, thank you. We've heard of uh, a community on the ground, we've heard of the virtual communities, but also on the list of topics to talk about tonight is the diaspora. Unfortunately, Ahmad Said, who wanted to be with us tonight, couldn't make it, he fell sick, but I think that you also have looked a lot into this. I saw that he just launched an essay contest on the issue of diaspora, where you ask for contributions of people who live in diaspora. So could you maybe elaborate a bit more? What do you see as the value of the, the diasporas in terms of political exchange? change, how do they belong to the communities uh, here and there, how do they connect them, and what kind of space is it on their own? Thank you. I mean, uh, definitely, when we talk about diaspora, and most uh, countries in the region have had large diasporas for a long time, these diasporas for a very long time were perceived mostly as a source of income source of remittance. You know, they, they send money, they go maybe once a year or once every two years back to their countries. But we are seeing a new type of diaspora emerge after 2011. Uh, some of it is new in the sense of these are new arrivals. Uh, I mean, Germany has seen the arrival of a new and large Syrian diaspora, of a new uh, type of uh, Egyptian intellectual diaspora as well. I mean, we were just discussing before how Berlin has emerged as sort of the, what London used to be for Arab journalists and activists 20 years ago. Berlin is playing that role today. But in this new diaspora uh, is different from the older generation. Uh, one, they're a lot more politically active in their home countries. They follow much more closely. Uh, in part because it's facilitated, again, by social media. The physical presence is no longer there, so they follow every day. Um, they are also, in some cases, voting, uh, sometimes voting remotely, sometimes actually flying to their home countries to vote. Many of them are supporting projects in their home countries. And I think we need to understand the role of diasporas and, and the space they occupy, which may not be local, uh, which may not be virtual, but is somewhere somewhere different and interacting. And there are many, many interesting examples. Uh, I'll give you one from my home country in Lebanon with the recent protest. Many members of the diaspora were ordering sandwiches online and sending it to the protesters uh, in downtown Beirut. So friends of mine uh, who were sitting in Dubai, in Abu Dhabi, me sitting in Paris, I can go online, you know, the equivalent of, I don't know what's common in Berlin for food delivery. Uh, what, you know, Deliveroo or whatever it is, uh, and going and saying, send 50 sandwiches to this protest. Um, in Tunisia, we've seen, and it's actually been very interesting, members of particular communities, uh, which used to always send to their village, to their town, uh, money to help their families. They organized themselves by a Facebook group. And so this was a Tunisian diaspora from one town, but some of them were in France, some of them were in North America, some of them were in other Arab countries, some of them may have been actually in Germany. And they ended up deciding, instead of each of them sending, let's say, $200, they pooled the money, they went to see the mayor, and they actually built a youth facility. This is, again, driven by the diaspora. Uh, we are seeing new ideas about cultural preservation uh, in Iraq actually being driven by the Iraqi community in London. Uh, and again, these, these things are developing very, very fast. I think it's a very interesting aspect and also not just in terms of concrete projects, but also as vehicles of new ideas. Uh, people in communities in the diaspora are also exchanging, obviously, with the host countries where they're living, their, their home countries, their second countries in many cases, but they're also exchanging with other diasporas and they're learning from other diasporas. It could be learning from the Armenian diaspora, how they've organized themselves. It could be learning from another uh, Arab diaspora that's been there for a while. So what we're trying to do at ARI is to better understand this, highlight interesting initiatives, and maybe in a way help disseminate, uh, uh, I think, some of these ideas. Uh, again, I think if we look at some of the uh, recent examples, for the first time, the Lebanese diaspora uh, is actually funding a think tank in Lebanon to push for reforms. I mean, for me, this is very political. 
They're no longer just saying, okay, good, take the money and do whatever you want with it. They're saying, we want to have a say. Um, and I think if you look at other contexts, if you look at the role of the Irish diaspora, if you look at the role uh, and what they've done, if you look at the role of the Armenian diaspora, the role of the Jewish diaspora, you'll see that these can have long-term impacts on their home countries. And I think it's very essential. I'll just plug. So we have a student prize. So if anyone is a university student, undergrad or graduate, and they feel like reading, uh, writing an op-ed about 1,200 words about their ideas of how diasporas could affect this, send in, we're giving $500. So it's a cheap <laughs> plug, but you can go see it on our, on our website as well. And then you can donate sandwiches with it to protesters exactly. wherever you want. Um, Dina, we talked also about what came up, the linkages between different diasporas. And that, of course, is something that we hardly ever see. Germany, when there is a discussion, we talk about integration of refugees, of exiled people here. But we don't talk about the links they have between themselves. Would you mind giving us a, an impression? How does it look from your side? How much do they interact? Um, I think it's interesting how it's been developing the last few years uh, sort of organically uh, without any uh, sort of uh, formal uh, linkages, but it's um, it's just happening where uh, you will find Syrian activists, uh, uh, people from the Egyptian diaspora, Sudanese activists, Algerian activists, and um, these sort of come together when, um, when there is solidarity protest for Lebanon, for instance, or solidarity protest for Sudan, uh, we're asked to come and be together, give speeches, help organize. Um, and I think there is a realization developing that um, we cannot just, as much as it's important, of course, to engage with the host communities, but also relying on each other for solidarity and support. Different diasporas are also as important as sort of engaging with the host community and working with the host community, but also supporting each other, this exchange of information, exchange of knowledge and experience, especially between older revolutions and younger revolutions like Sudan, like Algeria, and then Egypt and Syria has been ha happening sort of um, uh, spontaneously and organically among different activists. And recently, um, I think a couple of months ago, we had a very interesting e event about organizing in the diaspora, and it was in Arabic, um, and it was called for by an adopter revolution, uh, so a Syrian organization. And we had uh, we came together as uh, Syrians, Sudanese, and Egyptians, and we had sort of a discussion about what kind of activities we're doing in the diaspora, what worked, what didn't work, what kind of role do we have, and sort of to think together. And in that sense, I think the diaspora gives us this space to interact uh, really closely with uh, very different experiences, but also um, just branching out, not even just for the Arab diaspora, but also interacting with Latin American diaspora, for instance. Um, um, where you find Colombian activists and uh, also coming together in solidarity with Sudanese activists and Sudanese activists engaging with the wider African diasporas. Um, so in that sense, um, the, the presence in diaspora gives us this exposure and this interaction with different experiences and facilitates this sort of uh, exchange uh, in a much uh, faster way than uh, when you're in the local context. Would you like to add to this, Ahmed? I mean, you came here in August? Yes, so I haven't uh, much experience yet with, uh, with the Egyptian or Arab diaspora or any other, actually. So, uh, no, I don't have anything significant to add. <laughs> Great. So I would like to invite all of you, if you have questions, please feel free to make yourself known. Uh, in English, auf Deutsch, stellen Sie Fragen. Sie können sich... You can also ask questions in German. Please give a show of hands and please be brief in your questions. And if you would like to address the question to someone specifically on the panel, please say this. And as long as I do not see a hand here, I will use my privilege here on the podium and continue with my questions. That I have on my, I mean, as, so, as long as I don't see anybody raising their hand, I'll just go on with you because I still have very interesting points that I took from your interventions and from your contributions. You know, for example, you talked about the Egyptian state learning how to counter 
descend, how to manage activism in a way that it is either, either repressing it or co-opting it. Uh, you were talking about this form of learning also um, when it comes to the community. They reorganize, they find different ways. But really, coming back to the German politics towards Egypt, do you have the impression that there is no learning from the European side, that still there is not much solidarity from here, something that could be improved in that regard? And if so, what would be your advice? What can we do to st more strongly look at people who want to participate and um, support their claim? I mean, I always find this question one of the most challenging ones, and um, I really need to sort of develop a, a quick and uh, very pointed answer. Um, but I, I usually ask my um, German colleagues and friends who uh, sometimes ask me this question is to, to think together. I think, um, I think my German colleagues and friends and German scholars are in a better place to tell me how can we build some substantial sort of solidarity together and how can we um, better work with the government together to paint a different picture. But I would say one of the, let's say, myths that I have been hearing since I came is that um, the current regime is good for stability and um, and to sort of um, one of the disappointing things have also been how Germany seems to be more preoccupied about uh, closing down borders and uh, inhibiting migration and this seems to be what gears its sort of policies currently um, towards Egypt and um, and I think this this is maybe one of the things that we can change the perspective about this idea to be migration uh, driven policy or that this is the only reason why uh, sort of Germany supports a certain regime or not is that to inhibit or curb migration that this is the main factor uh, because um, to me this is uh, somewhat dehumanizing also uh, um, so if we could work together on changing this this mentality, this policy, and think of ways uh, to engage more productively, more equally, and um, that sees the, the Egyptian people who also, like the German people, strive for democracy, want a better quality of living, see the connected struggles more than just uh, look at them as a threat, oh, and they just need to be kept behind the Mediterranean, and, and that's it. Um, Well, I thought that you wanted to add because, I mean, this is partly your topic in terms of human rights, right? That Europe has this security-guided discourse, the anti-migration discourse. So please, Nadim. Sorry, I couldn't resist on that one. Um, you know, I also want to just start by, I think, the word that Dina said, which I think is the most important word, is solidarity. Um, and I have to say what I loved about these papers is that they are sophisticated, nuanced papers. You know, there is a uh, over uh, reduction. You know, the, the Middle East and North Africa region is often reduced in debates, even since 2011. It's either you over romanticize the revolution or you go cold on the revolution um, very, very quickly. And the truth is, these are societies that are vibrant, complex, with good and bad, like any other society. And they're also your neighbors. So I think the, the idea is here to develop a more sophisticated, nuanced, solidarity-driven, and realize that underneath the fears, the phobias, the projections of they're different, it's actually very similar. And the challenges of a urban poor in Cairo, even if the scale is different, is some of the same questions that maybe Berlin is. And what's needed is not a top-down, but a much more you know, where there are experiences to be learned, let's share them and let's learn. I mean, sorry, just, I think this is, this is very important. Uh, the second point that I do think is, you know, uh, these countries are not Germany's or Europe's burden to save. We all need to get rid of the white man's burden complex. It's not helping anyone, it's not helping the countries, and it's not helping Europe. If we can, once we get over this, doesn't mean that there's not something to do to assist, but the, the second step is then do no harm, okay? Because not only uh, right now, the policies of most European countries, definitely in Egypt, but not just in Egypt, are actually making the situation worse. 
I mean, we could put Turkey, we can put Libya, we can put Egypt, we can put so many countries on this list. In the name of security, controlling migration, better the devil you know, in the name of countering terrorism, uh, governments and taxpayers are wittingly or unwittingly, purposely or, uh, you know, without, uh, you know, with sort of good intentions but bad results, empowering this. These technologies that are being used to track down activists in Egypt and elsewhere, it's not Egyptian state engineers that develop them. They're importing them from Europe. And guess what? They're importing them from Europe by saying, we're going to help you, uh, you know, fight terrorism. But they're not using them to fight terrorism. Okay, that's why I think one. Two, when you think about all the, I mean, I wish Europe and Germany would ask for as much transparency on how they're spending their taxpayers' money in these countries as they do uh, in their home countries. Why? Because this money is being used to prop up corrupt regimes. Uh, and by that way, you know, these regimes become stronger because then they can use it to distribute. I actually think a big important, uh, thank you, a big important part of the legitimacy of regimes like Sisi, like Saddam Hussein before in the 80s, like Gaddafi, like Assad, and so forth, is because they are somehow convinced, managed to convince someone in the West that they are reliable partners. Well, this countries in the region, societies in the region are saying, we don't want this anymore. We don't want these rulers. We don't want this patriarchy that has been dominating us for 40 years. And I think that's what's really interesting is, it's not, there's not gonna be an easy solution, but in these spaces, in these experiences, even if it's only 40 people, to get 40 people who may not know each other very well, who may not be living in the same country, to collaborate, to create trust, is a revolutionary act. Because when you grow up in a society where you're told you have to obey what your father tells you, you have to obey what your teacher tells you, you have to obey what the general tells you, and then suddenly you're actually in a space where you say, we're gonna have to put the rules together. For me, that is a revolutionary act, and that's how you build the citizen, and the best way to create this sort of new societies is to support these citizenship-led initiatives and also to get the governments to stop harming, to stop preventing. If you want to help, make sure Germany does not export lethal technology to these countries. Make sure Germany is not funding projects, infrastructure projects in Egypt that are killing the environment, that are uprooting citizens, and that no German citizen would accept for Berlin. So why should it be okay to happen in Cairo but not in Berlin? This is the only thing I would ask. Thank you, Nadim. Bye now. We have a question here. Yes. Two questions, actually. Um, first of all, thank you all for your input and your activities. Very interesting. Uh, I have two questions directed to Ahmad. Um, and sorry for my ignorance. Today I learned for the first time of your project, so I might ask questions that are not uh, justified. Um, so I have the feeling it's a knowledge-producing platform you are creating with, your, with the women and also men. And what I was asking myself is, what is the impact on the offline world or what is the linkage? And do you get input from offline or do you also collaborate with projects offline? Um, and secondly, um, you said you tried to cross, um, try to cut across ideologies like Marxism, also Islamist uh, feminists or women. Um, what do you do to also reach rather poor women that might not have access to the internet, that might be illiterate? Um, yes, this, this is basically what I would okay. like to know. Um, regarding the first questions about the question, uh, the first part of the question about uh, physical, uh, uh, the physical existence or face of the project, uh, in fact. Um, the project has as much uh, existence in the material world as it is in the cyber world because um, most of the content and, and material published on the, on the website are actually created in uh, group working sessions. People meet uh, and sit together and work, uh, collect resources. Um, th there has been um, a long history of uh, collectives and NGOs in, in, uh, in Cairo and in Beirut and in other Arab cities uh, working in, in, in this field of uh, women issues and gender studies. And they have huge resources uh, that are 
for for practical reasons are uh, inaccessible to the to the public because they are uh, located in in physical libraries within offices or buildings with restrictions on access difficulties and part of the of the of the role that the group has seen for itself that uh, uh, is to um, gradually uh, Asurp, if I may say, or transfer this knowledge into a, a form that is uh, more accessible and easier to uh, access to the to the public. And they are, and for example, they are doing um, uh, weekly sessions under the title of Naqra min al Wiki, which would translate to uh, "Let's read something from the wiki." And these are uh, study study groups, study circles. Uh, they read together, they discuss, uh, they elaborate on the subjects, they uh, agree and disagree. And so, yeah, uh, this this aspect has been very much present uh, in the project so far. Uh, and the same happens in the in the Beirut Collective, for example. Uh, um, an offshoot from the group that was established in Cairo exists now in Beirut, and, uh, and another is being established in Tunis. Uh, so there are regional uh, uh, aspects to the to the project as well. Um, the second part regarding uh, can you remind me the poor? Well, this is this is yeah this is more difficult uh, because um, the nature of the project depends on being able to read and produce knowledge, and it doesn't see itself like other initiatives that uh, aim to. Uh, uh, educate or uh, enlighten uh, poor women on the issues of gender and equality and uh, uh, how, how a certain uh, socio-economic uh, uh, system is affecting their lives. And th these are projects that have their own uh, domain and their own um, way of being conducted and managed. And this is different. This is by people who may be seen as uh, part of the educated elite, not, not, not economic elite, but people who read and, and who, are, who have the capacity and, uh, and um, resources to allow them enough time to study, which is something that's not available for everyone in, in our countries. Many people have to work day to day just to survive, and many people do not have the resources to get uh, a decent education that allows them exposure to the global discussions of, of everything, of urbanism or of uh, women's issues. So this project also does not claim to be a grassroots initiative that would go from village to village in Egypt, but rather uh, an attempt at uh, facilitating work between people who can uh, participate to it. Maybe not the best answer, but this is yeah. how it is. Great, thanks. Uh, we had one question here. Uh, uh, yeah, it's a more general question about the spaces of freedom you have uh, as activist or journalist in Egypt today, because there is the perception of every dissent is oppressed, nobody can do anything, or he is labeled as terrorist. But then I'm in Beirut um, participating sometimes in a jury for um, all over the Arab world uh, award, a journalism award. And for three years, the best and the most daring investigative reports came out of Egypt. And when we asked them, so how can you publish this? They said, yeah, we can play between the Ministry of Interior, between this intelligence service and this intelligence service. So my question is, how iron is the iron rule in Egypt? Is it like a pyramid, controlled as Iraq was under Saddam Hussein? Or do you have competing power centers where you can maneuver between and sometimes space can be there, uh, which is hard to explain? I, I, would like to I would like to collect a few questions first, and then we go through okay. the... I will forget. <laughs> yeah, it's on the tip of or anyone who <laughs> I would like to follow up on that subject. I would like to ask everybody, um, how do you make sure state intelligence and security forces don't undermine and infiltrate uh, opposition online groups? And how do online activists deal with um, state surveillance? Okay. 
Um, mine's a follow-up on that, um, building off it, not just in terms of the technicalities of how you are oppressed online, but how does that actually play into um, people's feelings? Like, how does it make them feel and um, uh, decide about how to participate? Does it influence decisions of participation? Um, is that different in diaspora than locally? How do you just navigate that complicated field? <laughs> My question is about solidarity. Is this term is any more could be used? I mean, this belongs to the Cold War era, I think. And now it's very clear that the challenges for humanity are common. I mean, environment, war, refugees, everything. So I think the political movements, which claim that they are progressive, democratic, I think they should. Uh, adopt a different discourse, a different word. Solidarity means that I have a case, you have another case, but I show sympathy to you. It is not the same, now this is the case. Now, uh, Boris Johnson is not showing solidarity to Trump. He is he's collaborating with Trump. The, rich, uh, the right extremists in Europe, they have a common platform. Even the other, they are, uh, nationalists, but they collaborate. So I think it's time to invent a new word instead of this solidarity thing. Thank you. Um, I think with this, uh, we first um, take it back to the three of you. We have questions that are regarding the space of activism and how to maintain that, how iron is the iron rule and how to avoid infiltration. Then the navigating between the feelings. I think that was very much coming from your field of emotional attachment, Dina. And then the solidarity question, do we need another word for solidarity because solidarity somehow has changed? Who would like to start? You want to take it? Um, so how do, how do people still resist? I mean, I, 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 I also find it uh, fascinating. <laughs> I'm an Egyptian, I also am involved, but I still find it. But I would rather not um, think about it in terms of competing power structures, which may uh, be the truth, but I would give it back to people's bravery, resilience, ability to um, to navigate very different... Rea like, I would give it back actually to the people. And, and you, you spoke of journalism, and for me, what was what is still fascinating is the Madame Master experience, for instance, um, who I, I was able to meet and I was able to discuss with them after the last raid. And, and for me, it is still, um, still a question of... Um, um, yeah, I, I don't know how they are able, uh, I still, I really don't, I just give it back to their bravery, resilience, belief in the cause, um, um, and passion about what they do. Um, um, in the question of feelings, I mean, I think the feeling of, of insecurity does govern, of course, people's, uh, not in the diaspora and inside constantly. Um, how how they want to what do what do they have to say what can they say when how where like definitely feelings of paranoia to some extent feelings of fear it's definitely but in some cases um, um, you have really no choice but to like in in the case of Maspiro for instance your home is being threatened so you really have like there is no other choice it's a case of survival of so you really have no choice but to sort of resist but of course uh, feelings of uh, insecurity has is, is one of the main things that uh, and fear are inhibiting people's choices to take to the streets definitely or to sort of invo be involved in activism um, I, ag I agree with you Hassan about um, this need for a common platform, this need of further collaboration, and that sort of our stream of thought is is the worst organized, and not just inside, but also uh, everywhere in the world. Like it's a, if you want to say the left or center left, or it's, it's one of the very, um, uh, yeah, but I, I, maybe the, the sort of the challenges that are being posed could be one of the reasons it would push us forward uh, to more finding more common platform. But yeah, um, I agree with you. 
Well, uh, I have little to add. I mean, uh, I was going just to say that I know what you were referring to when you talked about the, uh, the fascinating reports. And um, yeah, their offices was raided, I mean, a month ago, exactly. Because they have to now. Now they have to, because if they stop, they become individuals and they are easy targets. But as a, as a, as a working co uh, journalistic uh, collective or organization or uh, institution, they, ha they have their voice heard. They are doing work that people around the world are interested in and would uh, uh, raise their voices for them if they are raided again or uh, arrested. But if they stop, that means actually the demise of them as individuals, which is systematically has been the, the approach of the regime. Once you stop, you are targeted. I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't end. It's not that so, so some people have been have have quit politics, but they, they keep going back to jail every year in the annual anniversary of the revolution. I mean, it's, uh, yeah. yeah. But it's not their choice to continue. It's not their decision alone. They could simply be closed. And I'm fascinated that... Oh, sorry. Yeah, 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 but that's, that, that's, that's true. And here comes the role of being able to work from everywhere and uh, the role of information technology that supports work because their work will not end if uh, their license is, uh, is, uh, is voided or if their office is uh, physically closed. Uh, and, the, and as I was saying, the state has learned this lesson and it's better maybe to keep them open under their eyes with uh, some informant in the office <laughs> rather than, yeah, I mean, these things are actually happening. There was the, sure. I mean, did you want to say something on how to avoid infiltration or add something on the solidarity? Uh, no, I mean, infiltration is, uh, there, is no, there is no cure against it. I mean, if you decide to, uh, to uh, work publicly, I mean, unless you go completely underground and become a secret society, which then doesn't achieve much and doesn't gain you the trust and doesn't have the potential of, cha of actual change, if you, as long as you are committed to public work and peaceful work, then there is no point in trying to avoid infiltration. Uh, you, you always have to work with the uh, assumption that you are being uh, eavesdropped on and that maybe some of your uh, collaboratives are uh, informants. Uh, yeah. yeah, just on, on the... Um, I wanted to, to comment on a couple of things. I think one is the issue on the word of solidarity. I mean, I think it's an important question you ask. Um, you know, for me to answer is either we can invent a new word or give a new meaning to solidarity. Uh, I tend to think maybe we need to give a, another meaning and, and, and a new meaning. But maybe underneath that, I think the biggest challenge, uh, and we're seeing that not just in Egypt, but in many countries in the region, but also in many new movements in, in Europe as well, is a lot of the new movements are very horizontal, right? Particularly amongst the youth. They don't want to be structured. Uh, I mean, we saw that not in just to, to move it away from the Arab example, but we saw that with the Gilets Jaunes in France, right? They refused to have a representative. They refused to organize themselves. And sometimes that makes solidarity even harder when you don't have something to, to latch on to. You know, who are you so in solidarity with? How do you support? Um, and I think that's going to be a challenge because for me, I think what, what's really been interesting looking back is since 2011, there's a lot of new energy that is emerging. It's almost like, you know, the, the society, I always say like societies have been taken out of the freezer, you know, and so they're coming alive again and there's a lot of energy coming out of it. Uh, at the same time, it, it is quite chaotic and, and, and how sustainable will these initiatives be, I think is the big question. And what the uh, uh, forces f of the counter revolutions in the region, and there are many, are counting on is the issue of time, because they are very organized, they're very wealthy, they have the institutions, they have the structures, they're learning, they're buying the technology from the West, they've got the big support, um, and what they're saying is they're gonna get exhausted before us. And in some cases it's true, but you know, one Egyptian activist told me, and I can't remember now the exact, how he phrased it, what was the exact word, but basically we're seeing new forms of intermittent activism. You basically see activists take a time out because this goes back to issues of mental health and exhaustion. I mean, people want to live as well, right? They're exhausted. 
And we're seeing people, they take a time out from their activism. A year, two years, they do something else. And sometimes you see them going back in, maybe in a different form. And I think that's going to be an interesting phenomenon to follow. Is this going to provide some sort of uh, form of new sustainability for the movement? So instead of having what, used to, what we used to think of the old opposition movements in the Arab world, you know, either the communist parties or the Islamists, very top down, very structured, it gave them some cohesion. But then if you took out the leadership, you sort of weakened them. We're starting to see this new form. It's a bit more diffuse. You don't know who's leading, and you don't necessarily have a few leaders. But maybe you'll have people coming in and out. People getting too tired. They come out of the scene. They, they rest. And then others uh, take the lead. I, I think we're starting to see something like this. I'd be very curious if you're seeing this in, in Egypt. But we've definitely seen it, for instance, in, in Syria. I've seen some examples in Egypt. Uh, and I think that will be uh, interesting. I think the last example on, on the red lines, I think, the, I mean, for me, the, the saddest part in Egypt, having worked a lot on, on Syria and Iraq for many, many years, is the regimes in these other countries also had red lines, but the red lines were never fully defined. Some red lines were very clear, and you knew if you crossed that red line in Egypt, you know, the closest red line is if you're a Muslim Brotherhood or if you're somewhat affiliated. That's a clear red line. There's no messing around. And then you have, you know, red lines that are dotted red lines. And you never know until you get to it. And the eternal question is, that, you know, why was this person arrested and not this person? They did the same thing. And this used to be the big paranoia of activists in Syria. And I see that paranoia now, the regime managed to export it the, in Egypt to Egyptian society. So by this pointed red line, it actually reduces the cost of repression for the authorities. Because you're constantly spending an enormous amount of energy thinking, am I crossing the red line? Or get, you know, and then what the second point is, well, how come they arrested Dina for saying this, but they didn't arrest Ahmed? So maybe Ahmed is an informant. Ahmed's probably not an informant, but at that point, you're creating barriers of mistrust between activists. And as someone who worked for almost 20 years on Syria, I can tell you it can have long damaging effect on trust and ability to mobilize. I think there was a question here. So, yeah, thank you all for your contribution so far. Um, me and my organization, we are working in Egypt, uh, having a, running a project on local council elections. Um, as you know, according to the 2014 constitution, uh, local council elections are supposed to take place, uh, but they don't do, and they don't do, and they don't do. But my question is, what do you think? For how long this will go on, that's a, that the local council elections will be postponed? And once they are announced, do you think that this can actually be some new political space or, or some space that actually allows real or actual political participation? Um, Ferdinand of Adopter Revolution, I have a question on something Nadim said in the beginning that the new social contract in the Arab world or in the Arab states that you were looking at isn't found yet and it was uprooted in 2011 but a new one isn't found yet. My question, a little bit, you said something going in that direction already in your last answer on the topic of solidarity. You said societies were taken out of the fridge and now a lot of energy is created. But my question is a little bit, when First of all, when will there be a new social contract? And this, probably the second uh, question is, is this an issue of another 10 years, another 20 years, another 100 years? I don't know. Do you have a thesis on that? Also, do the other two of you have a thesis on that? And probably the other question is, what is the way for these societies to find a new social contract? Because if you look at... Like this is probably the very big question. <laughs> look, if you look at the different states in the Arab world, they, they all are in very, very different states at the moment. And um, I don't know which of those ways is going to lead to a new social contract that would enable those states to be rather stable again in one way or the other. Would be very interesting if you could say something on that. 
Great, thank you. I think we have enough time left for each of you having a short response on this, even though it's very big topics. On the one hand, a very precise one on the local elections. At the same time, the new social contracts. Are we looking forward to a time when we have one and will we still live to see it? Maybe um, connect this with your final statement. And this time I go from here to there. Um, very briefly on local council elections, my own view is I think uh, the regime in Egypt will hold them when they'll realize they actually need some local council to, um, to basically absorb local anger. Remember, if you look at the experience of how Mubarak used to use local councils through his political party, it was their way of having sort of ears on the ground and diffusing certain tension. I think what's been really interesting, but I'd be interested, very interested to hear my sort of Egyptian colleagues' take on it, is the way the current regime has used power is very top-down, very isolated. So there's actually very little to absorb any shock if and when a massive shockwave. So there's a high level of repression. It's a bit like the Syrian model. Once it sort of elevates, there are no, uh, we would say in French, garde fou. There's nothing to sort of absorb that shock. So I think they might find it interesting and in their own uh, interest to create it. The only reason they're not doing it now because they haven't invested in creating a local machinery. So Mubarak had a party a local party, uh, CC has not invested in it. Will we see it as part of their sustainability? I don't know, but I, I'm not an expert. I mean, uh, look, the social contract question is a very complicated one, uh, and it's also very dynamic. Uh, I think the, the, in the sense that uh, many of us, all of us are working, so there is a new social contract, and there are uh, some who are trying to impose a new one. But the one thing I would, I would oppose is, the states, these states were never stable before. There's sort of a presumption that they were stable before 2011, and now they're, they're sort of a chaotic. I actually think the social contract was probably broken at some point in the late 70s in most Arab countries, because basically there was, there was an initial uh, contract, not necessarily democratically imposed, but this idea of, you know, we provide you security and we provide you some form of livelihood. Okay, and this was the case in many, many of these countries. In the 80s, they continued with the repressive uh, part, but they took out the sort of social pact. Okay, there were no more jobs in Syria and Egypt. They adopted neoliberal policies, but never came with any sort of opening. So it's been broken since the 80s, and I think they've actually been unstable since the 80s, but it got delayed each time, you know, the first Gulf War, you know, uh, all sorts of reasons. What will it take it to get, what will it take to get there? That's the big question. I think you already have to, you need some successful examples. I actually think what's happening in Tunisia, uh, Tunisia needs a lot more support for it to be successful because in Tunisia, they are trying to seek a new social model. They have tried to reconcile the secularists with the Islamists. They are having big debates. They haven't succeeded yet, uh, you know, reconciling between the coastal uh, areas, which are seen as, you know, richer and the, and the hinterland and the interior. We're seeing now what's happening in Iraq and Lebanon, finally an emergence, people are questioning the idea of sectarian identity as the basis of citizenship. It may take decades, you know, I mean, we tend to forget, but before the creation of the nation state in Europe, it took centuries, right? I hope it won't be that, I hope it will be much faster. Uh, but I also think uh, we all need to be patient I get very frustrated when I meet European diplomats and they're like, well, 2011 failed. I'm like, imagine we were back in 1792 or 1793 in France. Would we have said the French Revolution has failed, right? Napoleon came back after the French Revolution. He was an emperor. He had even more power than the king at that point. So I think we need to, we need to, we need to play a long game. The problem is people on the ground in these countries are paying a very, very high price and generations are getting quashed. So we need to shorten their time. But I think we also need to, we, maybe it's easy for us here in Berlin to think that, but I think we need to be a bit philosophical and historical about what's happening and, and help as much as we can. Ahmad, for you, what's your take on these two issues? Um, well, I have just a, slice, more, a, little, a little comment on what, uh, on the localities point. I mean, in, in addition to agreeing to what uh, Nadim has been saying about uh, the, the state's inability yet to, to use it effectively, because the, ability, the, the state so far has been apolitical. It was against politics, which is something that uh, was contrary to Mubarak's uh, era. But 
I think also that on the long run, the state is trying to circumvent the localities system, the local council system altogether, because if you if you carefully see the trends in urban developments, you will find now that a substantial number of the inhabitants of Cairo, for example, live in 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 new developments, new urbanist what they call new urban communities that are not within the local council system. They are directly administered under this uh, uh, authority of new communities, and this is part of the executive branch. Uh, so there are so many people now living without local council representation or the possibility of that taking place uh, ever. And that's increasing according to the shape the the um, they are the, I mean plans like uh, 2050 you don't know they are um, dislocating people uh, selling the land to uh, real estate developers who are uh, building uh, gated communities that are also devoid of this notion of local councils and they are changing the shape of how this works uh, on a major scale it might not happen in the next decade. I mean, it will not be finished in the next decade, but if this is allowed to continue, I mean, in 50 years, maybe there will be only pockets of local councils left around uh, a city like Cairo. Um, yeah, just also on the local council issue, um, first of all, I have no idea when the election is going to happen. No one knows. Every year it's maybe this year, maybe this year. But um, And I think part of the reasons why it never happens is like what Nadim said, Mubarak had his NDP. He really had the numbers. And as you know, the local council says it's a massive number of people that could be easy infiltrated uh, by people that the, the state does not necessarily want to work with. Um, uh, so it's, it's a vacuum, really, that it needs to work a lot. And I think they are already working on making sure that they can fill it and I think they are, uh, from my knowledge, they are working on lists, they are working with local uh, youth, certain local youth to uh, first make sure that they can fill these numbers and then uh, only then do the elections. But I have to say that in 2011 up till maybe 2014, because part of my thesis, I worked with popular committees that developed in several uh, local areas. There was a lot of excitement about local elections. And there were a lot of local youth who wanted to run in the local elections, creating their own listen platforms, already starting their campaigns. And there was a lot of work done on the law uh, with civil society, with also grassroots movements. There was a, a lot of trainings on mahalliyet, so how to uh, run, what, it does, what does it mean to be a local represents so, so there's a lot of knowledge and a lot of sort of um, eagerness in local communities to run for local elections and and this maybe gives me a bit of hope that if the elections happen when the elections happen uh, that this could sort of revamp a bit uh, local communities' interest. Uh, but then again, to what extent it will be feasible um, to absorb some of the independent, not even opposition, but independent activists, I don't know. But and just one last thing about the new social contract. My, my fear is just uh, there could be a new social contract happening that is not necessarily a positive one. So there could be a new one in the making in, in some of the countries that is maybe with worse terms than what was before. Well, that's quite a dark perspective to end on. <laughs> but I think over this evening, we had a lot of inspiring things about the vibrant society standing up to the repression and what we can do to support them. Uh, remembering 2011 means remembering 1789, we take uh, from this. And I think um, in any case, uh, the constant topic here has to be how to avoid our governments contributing to repression and conservation of regimes. Thank you very much for being here, Nadim Huri and the Arab Reform Initiative. Thanks for your cooperation. Thank you, Ahmad and Dina. Thanks to the interpreters and my colleague Johannes for inviting us, bringing us together here and organizing everything. Thank you. Thank you.